Um, this is my first trip to Liverpool, so I apologise that it's taken me so long. <laughs> no, but I felt seriously guilty. Um, it's taken so long to be here, and hopefully it will not be the last time that I come. Um, I'm going to share the first presentation with my colleague Donna Henderson, because Donna and I uh, work very closely in Europe, as Peter, I'm sure, will testify. Um, we jointly lead the European Innovation Partnership for Active and Healthy Aging Action Group on Integrated Care. And Donna will speak particularly about that and how we've used that um, as a vehicle um, to drive forward our agenda. Um, but I wanted to share with you a Scottish perspective because um, for us, Scotland remains a part of the United Kingdom, may actually become a part of the UK government uh, <laughs> early, in, early in May, depending who you listen to. Um, but what I'm struck by is the similarities, particularly that we have in Scotland, um, that are replicated, particularly in the north of England. And we're very similar in a lot of ways. Glasgow has had the same economic challenges and health challenges as Glasgow, for example, moving from a very industrialised city um, into the new age and the challenges and opportunities that that brings with it. Um, but we've also got challenges of remoteness and rurality, uh, like there is across uh, the north of England. So we're a population of 5.3 million. Um, the health spend is 12 billion. And I think it would be important to say that the NHS in Scotland is radically different to the NHS uh, in England, Wales, and less so in Northern Ireland. Um, we have not gone down a market uh, route to try to drive up quality uh, and services. Um, we have gone down uh, a route of mutuality, um, partnership, and quality outcomes uh, as our performance management system to drive improvement, quality, and safety. So we've got a radically different way. We are not allowed to use commissioning uh, as a word in Scotland, although we actually do commission services, but you never heard that from, from me. <laughs> the other thing is that uh, we are now an integrated health and social care system. Uh, legislation was enacted uh, on the 1st of April this year, and we have established our integration boards in shadow form, and by the 1st of April 2016, they must be fully active, although a lot of them are actually are active now, and integrating health and social care. And we're moving uh, towards integration as a way of delivering sustainability of services. And it's interesting, as you go around Europe, everyone is talking about integrating services, be it at its simplest level between hospital and community health care, and it is more complex between health and social care uh, in community and institutional settings. But for us, the Scottish Government, which echoes uh, UK government policy, is that we need to play an active contribution uh, as part of a vibrant Europe, because we need to be part of the economic family that is Europe and is the engine room for a lot of our economic development and growth, but also Europe um, as a vehicle to market its products and services, which includes knowledge uh, to the rest uh, of the world, and we're committed um, to doing that. This is the vision for the NHS in Scotland. We have our vision on one slide. Um, basically what it says is everyone's able to live longer, healthier lives at home. We're going to do that by integrating health and social care. We're going to focus on prevention, anticipation and supported self-management. We recognise that hospitals are very dangerous places. People die in hospitals. You usually die in hospital from a different condition that you went into hospital with. So if you do go into hospital, it will be for as short a time as possible and we will look to get you home or into a homely setting with a reduced chance of you being readmitted. Now, no one can disagree with that. And in fact, the rest of the UK and all the regions of Europe have got similar visions and strategies. They articulate them slightly differently, but they're all very closely aligned. Whether you're a, a system like Germany, or whether an assurance-based system, or whether you're an NHS-like like system, we're all saying the same things. So in Scotland, our government has set out its vision for internationalisation. It basically says that international activities 
make crucial contributions to sustainable economic growth, we recognise that economic growth has a direct effect on the health of the citizens of a nation. And the government are committed to ensuring Scotland is a great place to live, work, learn, invest, visit and to do business with. Now, for me, what is intellectually interesting is that we have been specifically challenged, that's myself, Donna and my team, to look to see how through addressing the societal challenges that we all recognise day to day as we deliver health and care services across the UK, how through doing that we can create economic opportunities and advantage. And that's something we've never been very good at. That means we need to work very closely with our business community, small and medium-sized businesses, as well as global companies. Uh, and we need to bring all the key players together in a safe environment to work together. Working across Europe is not new. I know, looking around the room, a number of you are academics. And I'm just going to speak from a Scottish perspective. And please do not tell any of your colleagues north of the border what I'm about to say. But Scottish universities have been engaged in European activities for many, many, many years. But the way our academic institutions have been funded is that there has been a spirit of competition. Although our medical schools, for example, do come together and collaborate where there are tens of billions of euros uh, that can only be accessed through collaborative working, for all other projects, you've got individual academic institutions competing against other academic institutions, and the knowledge, experience, and expertise in dealing with Europe is locked into individual universities, and particularly the most successful departments. And as that is how professors are judged on a year-to-year -year basis, you can see how there are disincentives to collaborate uh, to the benefit uh, of the region or, in fact, to the nation. And we recognise that needs to change. Um, because for us, the NHS was always the two-bit player. It provided the clinical sites where research could be carried out, but it actually didn't benefit or get itself directly involved. That was to the clinicians who were aligned to the universities who had NHS contracts to deliver uh, services. But we've determined we need to work together. We need to bring academic institutions, we need to bring the NHS in Scotland, plus we need to bring industry together in true collaborations to engage with Europe because that's how we believe we can get the most out of that relationship. So the NHS in Scotland actually only really started to engage formally in Europe in 2010. We knew nothing really about it or its institutions. So the first thing I did was I rocked up in Brussels and knocked the door of the European Commission, knowing no one. And what you find out is people in the European Commission are incredibly friendly, because that is what they are paid to do. They are there to be friendly and to be facilitative. You can argue whether, in fact, they make any difference on, on a scale, but we can talk about that later, maybe over coffee at the end. But they are incredibly helpful. And they will bend over backwards to help you, particularly if you're transparent and open. Because what I learned very quickly is there is a different world in Brussels. It's a world that certainly I can only inhabit for two to three days at a time before trying to get back to normality. But you can imagine that people, particularly heads of unit and at director level within commission, have people knocking on their doors every day basically on the hunt for advantage and for funding. So someone coming along and not actually looking for funding or advantage in the first instance, but asking for support and help was actually light relief for them. And it was really advantageous from our point of view. So once we'd got some information and we'd made contacts and networks, uh, we put together a European a strategic framework and we set out our aspirations in a document so that the whole of Scotland could buy into it and we set out four key objectives and they were very simple and straightforward and these were those. Uh, we wanted to actively engage with European institutions 
to the benefit of Scotland, but also we wanted to share our knowledge, experience and expertise with others. It had to be a true collaboration and a two-way street. We wanted to build relationships and partnerships to learn from others, share best practice and collaborate in areas of mutual interest. Uh, we wanted to enhance Scotland's reputation in Europe and by so doing, create opportunities for securing inward investment into Scotland and generate economic <coughs> growth. And we wanted to influence, and yes, we did want to secure European funding from relevant EU funding programmes to benefit Scotland by supporting delivery of key strategic initiatives. And this was the other thing we learnt very early. There are a lot of people who go chasing money and become dependent on European money for employing staff and keeping their organisation afloat to the point where they are often bidding for projects which actually are simply a route to get money rather than to actually be a priority within their organisation or within their region or within the member state. And we vowed that we would not get into that hamster wheel that sadly a number of our colleagues, I think Peter's nodding, we all know that some people are in that situation. It's a very unfortunate situation to get into. But you need to be clear what you're wanting to do before you start. And that's what we tried to do. And we tried to simplify our engagement because you can be pulled in a hundred different directions if you're not careful. And we wanted to look at three key areas. European partnerships, research innovation, and equally important for us, deployment and at scale deployment. How to make transformational change working collaboratively. And of course, exchange of knowledge and learning. But for my team, the important thing we have to keep remembering is that we are not, when we go into Europe to engage, we are not engaging for the organisation that employs me, which is an organisation called NHS 24, uh, which was very similar in its start-up to NHS Direct in England, which no longer uh, exists. Um, it would answer the GP out of our service. But NHS 24 is our national provider of telehealth and telecare services. So we specialise in all digital channels of delivery, uh, promoting those channels where it's safe, effective and appropriate to service the needs of, of our citizens. We do everything other than hands-on direct care. But when my team is out in Europe, they are representing all component parts of Scotland, all component parts of the NHS and our local authorities, and always an eye to on the needs of our industry. So we work very closely with our academic colleagues, with our enterprise organisations, and it can sometimes be very tempting when somebody comes to you with an idea that you would say no, because it's not a priority for me or my organisation, but actually it may be for someone else. So you have to be very well networked within your region so that you can signpost to the appropriate organisation who could benefit from that opportunity um, or is looking for that type of opportunity. So local intelligence is as important as knowing what is going on uh, across the rest of the European Union. And that is what regions need to do to be smart about it. But all too often we're driven to be a little bit precious. And we've constantly got to guard against that. But the other thing we did is we actively engaged in go with government. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, because you can't do this on the cheap. I am sure that all of you who are engaged in Europe have got colleagues who think when you're not at your desk, when you're away participating in a European initiative or project, it's like a holiday. It's not. It's for us getting up at four o'clock in the morning, getting a flight to Brussels, and then you work. I was saying to someone earlier, I've been to Barcelona about 20 times. I've still not seen any of the tourist sites in Barcelona, and that is no word of a lie. The Ramblas, no chance, not seen that. Grada Familia, no way. Boqueria, no, not seen it. I go from airport, Ministry of Health, hotel, sometimes then to a restaurant for a very nice dinner, back to a hotel, and then the next morning back to the meeting, then to the airport, and then fly home. It's no life. Well, you've got to recognise that and go into that with your eyes open. So the people that you employ to work on European engagement need 
to understand that, and they need to be resilient. But your organization must put in support networks to make sure that they are safe when they are working uh, in this area. Because some places we put our staff are less than safe if you are not street savvy and aware of what you're doing. And we've come across that, uh, sadly, uh, on one uh, or more occasions. But our government has given us um, funding. They've given us uh, a million pounds per annum to engage on Europe on behalf of the NHS, which is a significant amount of money. But they are getting a 400% return on that investment year on year at this moment in time. But it's not an insubstantial investment. But we don't take that sitting down and lightly. But if you want to really maximise these benefits, you've got to devote the time and effort to it. So we've got buy-in from the most senior level of our government, from our first minister, from the cabinet. Um, and they have benefited out of that. You've got um, Nicola Sturgeon when she was the cabinet secretary for health, uh, met, met Neely Cruz, which our team set up uh, for her. Uh, colleagues from Scottish government um, likewise have met commissioners and so on and so forth. Um, they have been clearly um, lobbying round about uh, minimum pricing for alcohol, which is a national policy of our government, whether you agree with it or not, it's neither here nor there. They do that, but at the same time, they support the key strategic initiatives that we are trying to take forward. And I think it would be fair to say, Scotland as a region of the UK is actually punching above its weight uh, on a European basis with the amount of influence that we have. Because, and I'm sure Peter will, re will reflect uh, this to you as well, it is always a two-way street. You have to be helpful and supportive of the Commission. And if you are, and you have that respectful relationship, there are benefits that, that come out of that, as opposed to a take, take, take initiative. So from our government point of view, that's what they asked us to do. And it's not rocket science, and it's not difficult. Raise the profile of Scotland. Raise the profile of the NHS in Scotland. Promote Scotland as a leader in the provision of telehealth and telecare services, digital services, which my organisation specialises in, so that aligns with what we are doing. Develop networks and partnerships to share best practice and knowledge, common sense, um, and secure funding for the NHS. Now, again, it's not difficult, but you've got to be clear what you're doing and why you're doing things. And a lot of people aren't. So on that, I'm going to hand over to Donna, who's going to talk about one of the key initiatives, which is a real jumping off point for us, which was the European Innovation Partnership for Active and Healthy Ageing. Donna. But as George was saying, I mean, we've been on a bit of a journey in Scotland on the European engagement side. Um, I mean, it sounds like we're quite sorted and we've kind of got a very clear vision. I think it's only fair to say that um, we've, we've been on this journey for about three years, three and a half years. And when we started, we were really pretty green. And we've still got, a, well, a, I would say, a fairly long way to go. But as, oh, I'm going backwards. But as George was saying, I mean, I think the European Innovation Partnership, which I think many of you may have heard about, was a kind of flagship initiative by the Commission. Um, they kicked it off in 2012. And the rationale behind it was that they have been funding billions of euros um, worth of projects and actually not seeing the benefits and outcomes really across Europe from a health and, and social care perspective. So they really felt that we needed to try and do something new. So they invited regions across Europe, member states, to actually make commitments to join this European Innovation Partnership with no funding. So there was no money to be applied for. This was about regions making commitments to work together to try and improve um, uh, the health and well-being of European citizens. So they set up six action groups, and you can see them there. Um, and the one that's highlighted there in white, the B3 Action Group on Integrated Care, is uh, one very close to George and I's heart because we, uh, we coordinate that um, across Europe. Um, and in actual fact, back in 2012, with the inaugural meeting of that group, George sent me off to, to Brussels, as he does, and he said, don't come back unless we're coordinating it. So I thought, ooh, that's going to be interesting. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> clearly I'm still here. So we managed to do that. And uh, I think he's probably regretting that now. Um, but after over really the last three years, what we found is that we have learnt a hell of a lot. So although we didn't get funding for that from Scottish perspective, 
what we grew was an incredible wealth of knowledge about who the key players are in Europe. We've created a very, very good network. We do know who does what and who the movers and shakers are. For instance, you know, I mean, Peter, we, we know very well. We've come across you in various, um, uh, you know, different guises across Europe. And that's how close this network is. It's quite a small family. It doesn't take you very long to actually get to know who the key players are and also to align with your own strategic objectives. And that's the really important part. When we first started getting involved in Europe, we were really chuffed when anyone came and knocked on our door and we said yes to just about everything that we were asked to do. Now, we don't do that. We're much, much pickier. We know who we like to work with and we also make sure that whatever we're doing really is very closely aligned to what we want to do anyway. So it's closely aligned to our national objectives. That wasn't the case three years ago, I think it's fair to say. So I'm not going to dwell too much on European Innovation Partnership because we're not here to do a pitch for that, apart from to say that the Action Group on Integrated Care is the only one out of the six action groups that still has an open membership. And uh, if you want to know more and you'd like to consider joining it as an organisation or, or indeed an entity, just uh, get in touch with me and we can tell you more about that. Um, it's a very, very good vehicle to get to know who's who and who's doing what in integrated care in Europe. So that's my sales pitch. Um, so just to say, I mean, this is a kind of overview. We made a real, um, uh, you know, a, a real uh, commitment really, I suppose, from the start that we were going to get involved right across EIP. So we made sure that we're represented in each of the groups and we're actually on all six of the coordinating groups. So you can see we've got Scottish government representatives. We have the joint improvement team, which is an improvement network for Scotland across health and social care. We have ourselves, NHS 24, coordinating two groups and um, we have an independent organisation um, of uh, um, a voluntary sector providers called the Alliance that actually represents Scotland in, in one of the action groups in smart cities. So we've got a really good representation. Now it's interesting actually that Peter and I had a very quick conversation earlier about the fact that um, over the last three years, we've really felt that it's been well worth the time and effort and resource we put into this because it's taken a lot. And when you're not getting funding for that from European sources, you really do need to be able to justify to our politicians, our funders, what the benefits are for us. Why is it worth that investment? And I think it's fair to say that it has been worth it for us. However, going forward, I think we need to reshape what EIP looks like and certainly that's what we're now working with the Commission to do. But the important thing is we've actually put ourselves in a position where we can do that. We can actually shape how this, go how this looks going forward. And that's not just Scotland. I'm not talking about Scotland. I'm talking about all the regions that have committed to being involved in it. So that's another thing I think that's very important. We can actually shape European strategy by being involved in this. And I think that's something that's, that's really quite different about this uh, partnership. So that's just a quick slide about what we think the political added value is. And as you can see there, it is about mobilising, um, you know, changing the shape of policies, making sure that the new funding streams that are coming out, actually we can use to our benefit. So we're not trying to try and shape ourselves and what we want to do around the funding calls. The calls are actually perfect because they look like something that we would want to use and utilise, and that's very important. Um, we have to get this in because, you know, everybody talks about the reference sites. Um, mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, when the reference sites were first set up, they had this award ceremony and all the 32 uh, reference sites were awarded star ratings. So uh, we in Scotland, we put forward three different initiatives. So we got three stars for two of them and two stars for another. So we thought we did quite well. I think uh, our colleagues from the Netherlands also <coughs> did particularly well. Um, what does it mean? In reality, not very much actually. We got the stars and we got a wee certificate, but actually really, what does it mean? Um, now the initiative behind this was that we would have twinning and you would be able to use the reference sites to really share knowledge and, and uh, best practice with others. 
we're still really waiting for the Commission to get that bit sorted. So we kind of decided ourselves that we would move that on. So we've started to set up memorandums of understanding with some of our other partners. So for instance, the, the Catalan Health Ministry, the Basque Health Ministry, the Greek Health Ministry. So in Scotland, we're already starting to develop, well, we have actually developed memorandums of understanding and uh, action plans about how we can collaborate. Some of that is about jointly seeking new funding streams. Some of that is actually just about bringing our experts together and actually sharing practical, operational, good practice about how we can improve health and care delivery. And that doesn't cost any more than the time of those experts. So there, there's a real, um, I think if you wait for this to happen, it won't happen. You have to make it happen yourself when you've created these networks. Um, so I think we've made this point. We're really making sure that our existing strategies and what we do in Europe fit together and align closely. Otherwise, you're wasting your, your time and your effort. Now, this is the bit that I said I was going to ramp through very quickly because it's pretty, pretty boring. Um, but it's important because it brings money and we need money to do things. So again, what, when we first started in the European funding, as I said, we started getting involved in projects that didn't have an awful lot of influence and impact, I suppose, at a local level. And these are the different sort of uh, th th funding streams that were around. It's fair to say we didn't know too much about them. We know an awful lot more now, but we don't know everything. But we know the ones that are most useful and g give you biggest bang for your buck. So these are just, I mean, the next few slides are just um, the main ones that we're currently involved in. So they give you the overview of the kind of budget heading that we've got. But more importantly, it's the strategic fit that in these that's the important bit for us. So it's about what we're doing at a local level in our health boards and our local partnerships. And this is giving them extra money to try new ways of working. And what it's also done is it's given them a different, uh, a different perspective and dynamic because it's brought in European partners who have different ways of working. So it's kind of broadened the way that uh, we might look at things locally. Um, also brings headaches as well, <laughs> of course. Um, and there are all sorts of cultural differences and, and language differences that you need to kind of get round. But the bottom line is, um, I think the feedback from our health and social care partnerships that are involved in these projects is that this is something that they really do value and they, f they, 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 they feel that there's real benefit to be gained from a patient perspective, a service delivery perspective and a partnership perspective. So I'm just going to, I'm not going to go into any of these because as I say, you can run back um, and, and look at these later. I'm going to quickly touch on this one because CASA was an interreg uh, FI project, which is, is one which was purely about knowledge transfer. So it was facilitating knowledge exchange between partners. Uh, I think we had 11 regions and, uh, uh, that were rec rep represented in, as partners in this project. Um, so it meant that we had study visits, good practices, and that's really where our MOUs with the Catalan came from. And the action plan from that was all developed from this. So good things do come out of these projects if you make them work beyond the lifespan of the project. So I'm just going to quickly... Oh, Now, Horizon 2020, this is uh, really, this is a bit of a... a a swear word really actually around us just now because some of us bear the scars of, uh, of being involved in uh, some of the submission dates. There was a submission date for this yesterday. So there was lots of lost sleep over the last few weeks and grey hair and headaches associated with the deadline and getting things in. But Horizon 2020 um, has created lots and lots of interest, lots of activity. The success rate we reckon is around about 5% of those projects. So the reality is it takes a huge amount of resource to actually get to even the point of submission and the chances of success are pretty low. So you can't expect that even if you think you've got a fantastic proposal and a really good partnership, it's going to be successful because quite often and in the main actually we found that it isn't. So this is something that we are starting to really consider how much of the Horizon 2020 calls we will get involved in. We're looking at Interreg and others, and I'm seeing Peter nodding his head. You have a much better success rate in, in other funding streams like Interreg. So be careful about where you put your resource when you're getting involved in these things because it, you know, the success is not always guaranteed. 
So I'm just going to quickly, am I going backwards or forwards? I think we had Kaz in there twice. And now I have no idea because there's so many slides. Yeah, right, okay. Uh, see, now don't you just love technology? And that's me working for the Scottish Centre for Telehealth and Telecare. All right, we'll keep going. Uh, yeah, we're nearly there, we're nearly there. Right. OK, so these are the new ones coming through. So Ambient Assisted uh, Living Joint Programme, AAL, it's just coming out. The, the de well, it has come out. The deadline's May. We've had a couple of looks at this. And interestingly, some of the SMEs that we've approached can't participate because they can't afford to. The cost, as you see there, they can get eligible costs of up to 60%. Where they're going to get that 40%? It's hugely difficult for SMEs to get involved in some of these projects. So with that sort of ratio, we're actually finding it really difficult to actually get SMEs who are willing to engage. So again, these are the, the kind of considerations that you need to think about when you're getting involved in these things. Public health programme is something that we're looking at as well. We've already got a couple of projects in that. And again, we're looking at these sorts of avenues to uh, get a better outcome for us. Interreg Europe we've mentioned, and uh, I think we're going to be speaking to Peter about that later just to see if we can align some of what we're doing with other partners. And on that point, I think I'm going to pass back to George. So in summary, um, we've developed networks with the people we believe are the movers and shakers, the influencers, the senior officials within the commission. Um, we have included into the IP strategic plan um, and we've got active membership across the action groups and that really, that investment in time and effort has really paid off for us fairly significantly, particularly in building networks uh, from a standing start. Um, we've also um, joined a number of European organisations and there are hundreds of European organisations as you know out there and everyone wants you to join and you've really got to be very careful about the ones that you wish to join um, because A it costs money but also you want to make sure that they are strategically aligned with your areas of specific interest. Now at the moment um, I am president of the European uh, Telematics Association ETEL uh, which is a broad church. We involve industry, uh, academics, uh, health ministries, and we are really uh, advocates and a think tank for the use of digital technologies uh, across Europe. So we're not, not representing one group or, or another. And there are lots of them out there, so consider it. But also we've attracted a number of things to Scotland that we, wouldn't, we don't believe would have come if it wasn't for the engagement that we've taken. So we had the inaugural European Telemedicine Conference, which was hosted in Edinburgh, and just uh, last month, we had the International Integrated Care Conference again uh, in Edinburgh. And that brings in revenue um, to the country. But there is a downside in that you've got to commit time. And we host a whole host of visits. And these are just, just examples of last year uh, people that came from politicians to ministers uh, to health and care professionals to academics um, to people from industry who came to see what we're doing here. And this is actually important because I said at the start, only really get involved in this if you're prepared to have a two-way street because you can only take for so long and people will start to disengage with you. And Donna mentioned the MOUs, so Catalonia, Basque, Greece, uh, Norway, South Denmark, even in England, <laughs> just to demonstrate that we do go down to the south coast. So we, we took pity on the poor people of Kent because I heard they've got some good sparkling wine down there now, so we thought, mm, well, yeah, we'll have a go with Kent. But Kent County Council are quite interesting because they're looking at integrating services and they're using digital technologies as the catalyst to bring those together. So there was quite an association. But as I said earlier, we, th we think we need to look to the north of England, particularly the northwest, the northeast and Yorkshire, uh, to actually do much more in the way of collaborations going forward because I think there is a real strategic alignment round about the challenges and opportunities that we could bring to bear because I think in a lot of areas, our approaches to things are very similar. So uh, that would be a conversation out with, out with today, but it's worthwhile taking forward. So very quickly, our lessons learned. Political. You must have political support and buy-in at a local level. I'm talking about regional level rather than UK national government. UK national government, it may be different in England. They are not interested in Scotland. The single contact point for health in Brussels for the UK is a complete... Is there anyone here from UK government? No. 
they're a complete and utter joke. If you phone, you cannot find out who it is. In fact, it transpired that for six months we didn't actually have one and people working in the office didn't actually know she was off on maternity leave. Fact. Absolutely ridiculous. We get things that come up through Whitehall with a response time of one day to turn it round and it's been sitting on somebody's desk down in London for about two and a half months. And I suspect they treat the regions in England very similar. DH are really no good in this. And we've gone straight to the Commission and basically said, if you're looking for regional involvement, because the Commission recognises across most member states in Europe, it's the regions that are the delivery arms of health and municipalities or local authorities for care services. And they are now geared up to react to regions much more than they ever were before. For some things, they have to go through member states, but they can come directly to you as long as you make it an easy conduit and they know how to communicate backwards and forwards. So that's well worthwhile making sure you've got sorted out. But you need to be aware of the politics, particularly the politics at member state level. So we have looked to collaborate with a number of, of regions in Europe. And then when we approach our government, there's a, an issue. In the past, it was round about the very ultra-right-wing government in Veneto, in Italy, that uh, our government in Scotland had concerns about at the time. Um, and we have issues with Catalonia because of the sensitivities round about when Scotland was going through its referendum, Catalans doing the same. Um, there were sensitivities at a political level about Scotland and Catalonia being seen coming too close together. And even our Scottish National Party we're very sensitive about that. So if anybody thinks, and I'm not a nationalist, by the way, and I'll nail that, that colour to the mast, they are not screaming um, people about breaking up the, the UK, as Boris might have you believe. When you get into this European politics thing, they're very sensible, and you guys will be, be likewise. So, but be aware of the sensitivities. I was completely naive about some of, the, some of these things, completely naive. Um, but also understand the rules of engagement for the European Commission. They will be incredibly helpful, supportive and facilitative. That's their job. But they can sometimes only go so far. And you have to be aware of that. And you need to understand what they are looking out of, to get from a relationship. And don't push them too far because you have to recognise that there's a governance line that they are not allowed to cross. The thing we discovered very early is cultural differences. Cultural differences between the north of Europe and the south of Europe. It's not just the old adage about the, um, the uh, seminar starts at uh, 10 o'clock in uh, Bari in Puglia. Uh, we are there at 9.30 and the audience arrive at 11. Fact. <laughs> I don't know how they all knew how to arrive because they all arrived at the same time. It was quite incredible. But it's how you approach things. Um, the Nordics, very, we'll be asking you a very direct question. But in Spain and in, South it in southern Italy, they approach it differently. And you have to be aware of those sensitivities. The number of kisses, George. Oh, yes, the number yeah, of kisses. Yeah. <laughs> well, we can practice that later. <laughs> that Joan behave. <laughs> you need to understand what motivates others in that engagement. And you need to spend time to understand that. Don't try to do it on the hoof. You'll make mistakes. Um, but prioritise your involvement. You can be pulled left, right and centre. You will get invitations to speak uh, all over the place. So be careful. Um, <laughs> be clear about your strategic priorities for European funded projects. <laughs> Choose your project partners very wisely. Learn how to say no or you'll stretch yourselves far too, far too thin. But you need to speculate to accumulate, there's no doubt about it, and particularly with Horizon 2020. And don't expect a high level of success. And there's never enough time to write that submission bid. We all know that, no matter how early you start. But engage early, particularly with your local stakeholders. So we started with no one, and we have now got nine dedicated members of staff uh, who are working actively uh, on European activity. There's Donna and myself. We've got a senior European engagement manager who runs all of our European projects, European development manager and coordinators. So we've invested time, effort and put resource into this because we firmly believe 
It's not about attracting money. The only way we can transform, we believe, our services to make them sustainable in the long term is through true collaboration. We can no longer afford to not only own the problem but actually invent the solutions in Scotland. We need to share our knowledge, expertise and experiences and Europe is an absolutely ideal way to do that. And we're looking at providing support to the whole of Scotland um, to engage. It's no mean feat. But that's what we are trying to do through man matchmaking, signposting, awareness raising, events like this, and advice and guidance, because it's really complex and it's quite tough. And we try to make that easier, particularly for the front-facing clinical teams uh, that we want to work. So thank you very much. We've overrun uh, our time, as always. It's always <coughs> Donna's fault. And the one thing I always remember, never invite her to speak with you, but I keep doing it. I don't know why. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.